All right. Good morning. I'm Clarissa Carr, and I'm here with Dr. Feliz Sonmez. This is July 20th, 2022, and we are speaking with Dr. Mark Barrow today. Um, first, we'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. You're welcome. We really appreciate it. And I think to get started, um, we'd really like to hear uh, kind of a brief journey with your involvement in Gainesville's historic preservation. Oh, you got one. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Let me give you a little background. I'm a Floridian, a native Floridian from a little town in called Crestview. It's up near Pensacola. It's a small little town in Okaloosa County up there. My parents were both school teachers. My father was school superintendent and an attorney in Crestview, and my mother taught school for many years. They were interested in history. We had an old house in Crestview, which my mother fixed up uh, to her taste and so forth. My, I had two brothers, one uh, 12 years older named George William Barra Jr., uh, who uh, came, to the, came to the University of Florida. My father had come to the University of Florida in 1916. Uh, he was from a family of farmers, the Barras, up in uh, Okaloosa County, and was the first one to go to college, and he always wanted to go to college. And he went to the university for two years and then went into the World War I, was drafted, and was a drill sergeant in New York. And afterwards, he came back to Crestview and got his law degree and was, was an attorney and then got into politics and was, uh, uh, was on the school superintendent for many years. As a matter of fact, during the Depression, during the hard times. And uh, he also sold life insurance on the side, New York life insurance. Uh, my other brother, William Dean, uh, was four years older than me, and he uh, came to the University of Florida, and he was very bright, very smart. He went through the University of Florida and got his BS degree and his law degree by age 21, five years. Doubled up on the courses and so forth, and went back and was an attorney in Crestview. Later on, he was a senator at the, uh, with Flor at Florida at the Florida legislature in Tallahassee for a period of time. I then naturally wanted to go to the University of Florida. So when I graduated from high school in 1953, I went, I went there. Uh, I worked very hard. I was very interested in history. I majored in what was called pre-med, which is biology and physics and so forth. But I took courses in history and uh, so forth, and uh, so I went through, straight through because my mother was helping to support me. Although I had a job at the cafeteria and I got some stu student loans uh, and so forth, but I went through in three years and got a BS degree in 1956. I then went to, uh, was in the first class of the medical school that graduated in 1960 uh, at the University of Florida. And they were just building that and during my senior year, and I went down and applied, and there were 40 of us in that class of 1960, the first class. We're getting to cel celebrate our 65th reunion in a couple of years, actually. Uh, after medical school, I met my wife uh, in, while I was in medical school. She was from Orlando, and she was in, getting her degree in teaching, and also uh, ceramics, pottery. And uh, she was an expert swimmer on the swim team at the university and on the swim fins that do these anatomical dancing and so forth, whatever you call it. And she uh, also was, a, was an excellent champion water skier that skied at Cypress Gardens when she was in high school and early college. So we met on a blind date uh, during my second year of medical school, and then she got her degree and moved back to Orlando to teach as an intern uh, there. And we uh, went back and visited back and forth and for about a year. And then I went to Europe between my second and third year. And uh, we wrote back and forth while I was in Europe and really sort of fell in love with our letters writing back and forth. When I got back, we soon became engaged. We got married then in 1959. We were both interested in uh, not only history, but also preservation early on because there was a couple by the name of Sarah, uh, originally Sarah Ridgway, later Sarah Ridgway Morrison and Bob Morrison. 
He was from Pennsylvania and his mother had a big antique shop in King of Prussia. And they uh, were at the University of Florida and I was close friends with Sarah and I rode back and forth with her and her brother when I was in the university at an undergraduate school. And then they got married, he was in building construction and she was in education. And they wanted to go back to Fort Walton Beach, which is about 20 miles south of Crestview in Oklahoma County. And so we uh, we went by to see them after I got graduated from medical school. We got married and I graduated in 1960. I had an internship in Chapel Hill and we went by to see them in Fort Walton. And they'd brought this big old beach house on the sound up there, not on the, not on the Gulf, but on the, on the bay sound. And that thing was in terrible shape, was actually leaning about six inches to the right. And they were all excited they were going to restore it. He was in building construction and we thought, these guys are nuts. They'll never, they'll never get it fixed and so forth. We came back a year later and it was magnificent and it was filled with old, beautiful, wonderful antiques like this and this one and this one here. Uh, and we we just said we we want to, that's what we want to get into. So then I I went to finish my residency and fellowship and went to the National Institutes of Health in 1968 for two years. At that time, you could be deferred before being drafted. The draft was in effect. It's called the Berry Plan, and you could forego your draft status till you finished your residency or your fellowship. The day you finished that, you had to go into service, the branch of your choice. So I picked the Public Health Service, which administers the National Institutes of Health. It's under their bailiwick, and applied and went to the National Institutes of Health. And the Dental Research Institute, that's all they had left when I applied. But I didn't do anything about dentistry. There was a fellow there that was doing studies in the Southwest Indians to see how pure the tribes were and doing genetic studies. And I went with him to do physical exams and test their blood and EKGs and so forth to, to four or five of the different tribes there. These are some of the few memos left from that up that are on the, that are on the, the armor here. I had a whole collection of every Southwest tribe and every pot and ev of all of 14 Pueblos and every every pot and every basket and also every rug from the Navajo group, about 20 different areas that had different style rugs. So anyway, uh, while we were, we studied it, we went to Georgetown, looked at old houses. We went to Charleston, we went to Savannah and we were hot to have an old house. So when we moved back from NIH and I, at about that time in 1970, I went into private practice. I was with the University of Florida on the, on the faculty and decided to go into private practice and we wanted an old house. And we looked and we couldn't find one and we looked and we looked and finally, a friend of Mary's who was married to the uh, neuro, head of neurosurgery on campus, Dr. Lamar Roberts and his wife, Carolyn, she called Mary and said, I think the Tiger house may be coming up for sale. There's no sign out. But she, so that Sunday we just went over and the people were very, quite elderly. He was a he was a military history professor, but was retiring that year. She was apparently very wealthy because he had cabinets full of silver all over the house, tons of it. And we introduced ourselves and said we were, thought, heard that they might be going to sell the house. There was no sign. And they said, well, yes, we're, we're thinking seriously about it because we're too big for this house. And so forth. we've actually already bought a place over in Northwest Gainesville, a small little townhouse. And uh, we said, well, we would be interested in purchasing it. And uh, she said, well, honey, let's go back in the kitchen to talk about it. We, we, we probably do want to sell it. They hadn't made a decision yet. And we could hear everything they were saying. And she was saying, these are nice young people. We don't really need a lot of money. And uh, let's, you know, let's just go ahead and sell it. So he came back in. And now we had been looking at this type of houses, a colonial revival, two story, 5,000 square feet houses up in Georgetown and Savannah and Charleston. These are 350 to $600,000 then. So they came back out and he said, well, how about 35? And I said, you mean 350,000? He said, no, 35. So I looked at Mary, she looked at me and we said, absolutely, well, 
I had a contract in my pocket and we signed it on the dot. And then we could not get financing because when we went to, the, there were six banks at the time, we went to the bank, the bank, the banker president, you know, the, the branch bank would say, well, the, the, the board has decided we're not going to be loaning any money in the Northeast area because it's going down, the people are dying or moving out and it'll be slum place and it'll be bulldozed down and high rises we put there. That's the long-term plan for the city. So we couldn't, we had trouble getting a loan and we went to every bank in town. They all said the same story, but we were persistent and went back to the place called Fortune Federal three different times because that's where we banked, you know, pleading our case. And the third time there was an elderly gentleman there who was the greeter, who was about 90 years old his name was Mr. Brookings, and he, he hadn't been there before. And when we walked in, and Mary always got really dressed up to go to the banks and so forth, with high heels, beautiful dress, jewelry, and so forth, and all made up. And he he just you know touched Mary on the arm and said, "Come in, come in. I'm the greeter. I used to own the place, but I've retired." And we said, "What can we help you with?" I said. Well, we're trying to get a 30000 and we only wanted $30,000. We sold our other little house, we made 5000 on it, and said, uh, we need a $30,000 loan for the Tiger House. He said, Tiger House? I love the Tiger House. John J. Tiger was a, one of my best friends. I live only three houses down the street on 10th Avenue. It's a lovely house. I've been into it hundreds of times. And he said, uh, I said, well, we've been having trouble. We've been, this is our third time. He says, what? Says, though they're saying they won't loan money over here in the North. He said, come with me. Now, he still owned it, but he was retired. So he goes over to the door, doesn't knock or anything, just opens the door, and this guy's all dressed up and fancy and there. Johnny, these are the Barrows, nice young couple. They want to they want to buy the Tiger house. They want to loan for $30,000. He said, well, sir, you know, the board voted not to loan money over here. He says, what? There's nothing wrong with that area. I live in there. It's a fine area. It's not going down. You're great. Loan them the money. He turned and walked out. So that's the way we got the loan. So Mary started on that uh, project. And at that time, you could burn off paint with a, with a blowtorch. You got a blowtorch and had some helpers and so forth, painters and carpenters and all this, that, and the other she hired. And they were out there blowtorching and peeling off the paint. And two or three other couples bought houses in the area about within a few weeks and started working on their houses. And people that live there started working on their houses. And that started the preservation movement. Well, that was in 1970 that we did that. It took several years to, for her to restore that. And it was absolutely magnificent. Uh, you, did you say you'd been there? Uh, it's still magnificent. But when Mary did it, it it had these blue curtains and blue wall, light blue walls. It was, it was stunning. That's all I would say. It was on the uh, on the spring pilgrimage several times, and so when we used to have a big, huge living room as big as this whole thing here, these two rooms, with a table in it, and we had started acquiring antiques at that time. And in 1976, we bought a little building. Uh, 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 next to the school, uh, the school superintendent's office. Uh, it was originally a church, and we made it into an antique shop called the Barra Family Store. It was later made into the uh, melting pot. After we after we had it eight years, we sold it to the melting pot, and we had an antique shop there. We had some very nice antiques that we go on buying trips to New England and all all around, all over the southeast on the weekends. And uh, we didn't make a lot of money, but we, f we furnished our house with some nice, very nice antiques and uh, had it for eight years. And so during that time, we looked at other houses and I was a jogger and I was jogging all over the neighborhoods and I would look at, look at the houses and I would get up the square footage and the price and the condition and I kept a record of all this. And so in 1976, Mary restored the Melty uh, Church into the Barra family store. And about a uh, month, few months later, a year later, we bought the Hodges house. The Hodges house was next door to the Episcopal church downtown next to city hall. 
And there were two houses there, Victorian houses built in the early 1900s, one called the Love House and one called the Hodges House. The Hodges House had been the, the office and house of Dr. Hodges at the turn of the century, a very noted early physician in, in, in Gainesville. And uh, we, we, none of the local movers would take it on because it was two stories and quite wide. We got a, a gentleman from a group called Hygema Movers in Jacksonville, and they could move anything. They could move stone houses, brick houses. They'd put them on barges on the St. John's River and move them. But he came over and looked and said, yes, I can move it. He said, but the, the love house, he measured the street width between the iron posts and all. It's about a foot on either side too wide. It's wider. But the Hodges house is about six inches. You know, on each side, I can move it. You just got to find a place to move it. So we looked around and we went to Southeast Gainesville, uh, where the Matheson house is, and found an empty lot behind a Swearingen house at the corner of Northeast 7th Street and, uh, I mean, Southeast 7th Street and Southeast 2nd Avenue. And behind it was an empty lot. And the gentleman and his wife that lived there was Oliver Austin, who was a very famous ornithologist and had up to that time written the definitive book on birds of the world, been all over the world traveling. He was elderly. Again, there was no sign or anything. We just, Mary just went up, got all dressed up, knocked on the door. Of course, he was infatuated with Mary and held her hand and patted her on the shoulder. <laughs> Cute little man. And then she said, we'd like to buy the lot behind your house to, and we want to move a house to it. He said, well, why don't you buy both my house and his house? And he sold it. I can't remember. Remember, ridiculously cheap, $40,000 or something, the Swearingen house. And so we moved the Hodges house that summer. And the deal was I would get it moved. And Mary, every summer, she went for two months up to Fort Walton Beach where we had a beach house. We called it the, the, the cottage or the wigwam after my brother, uh, whose nickname was Wig. And she'd go up there for two months. I'd go up there for several weeks, but I was still working. And the deal was I would get it moved. And then when she got back in, in, in September, she would restore it. Now, this area was really run down. There were drug houses, four or five of them in that area known to be there. There was student housing where there'd be 10, 12, 14 students in these houses and they just run down and so forth. Bad area, bad shape. And so we started on that and she restored both the Swearingen and the Hodges house. And then I got worried that maybe, you know, we'll get this done and people won't move over there because it's a bad area. But the opposite happened. Everybody started getting out, working on their houses, restoring their houses, fixing their houses, painting their houses. And people started buying houses in that area to store because the Northeast area was, the values had already gone up. They were costing more and more. That area had had a total turnaround starting in 1970 when Mary and the others moved in there. So this was this was in 1978, oh, 79, somewhere in there. And so we finished it and we decided to have a huge reception and advertise it so people could see it. And we had a huge number there because they were curious, maybe 150. And uh, it rented immediately and both of them and, and, and so forth. So then we began to buy other Victorian houses as they would come on the market if they were a good deal. And at that time, you could buy a big two-story Victorian house for anywhere for 50, 55, 60, 65,000. The next one we bought was called a Paget House. It is the first apartment that has eight apartments in it. It's over near the duck pond and it's on Northeast 6th Street. It's a big yellow house. It's in that book that I gave you, and you have to go by and look at it. It's beautiful. It's, uh, and it was, it was originally apartments. It's, the man built it, and then he got sick and died, and he sold it, and they, that family converted it to apartments and lived in one of the apartments. And so that was fixed up, and it has a portico shea, and it's a beautiful yellow color. The Hodges house, my wife, when she would buy one of these houses, she actually became a contractor of type. She didn't get a license, but she she hired a crew of eight and she did all the subcontracting and she supervised everything. And uh, they, would, they would restore between one and two a year for 20 years. She did a total of 24 in her career 
old Victorian houses in Gainesville, as, which is amazing. No single person has ever done anything close to that. But uh, so we would buy if they were if they were good, but reasonable buy and so forth. We would buy them and fix them up as, and call it Victoria Apartments. And the, the company was Victoria Restorations. And so uh, we had at one time we had a uh, we buy and sell some and fix them up and sell some. But uh, but she restored a total of 24. But it's, at times we owned as many as 14 and had like. 50 apartments or so in them. And we gradually sold those off and actually made a lot of money uh, doing it. Uh, and, uh, but we kept three, the Paget House, the Dean House, and the Pound House. We still own those as Victoria apartments. There are 18 apartments in them. And John, the architect, the third son, manages those for us. So that's how we got interested in it. Now, the people that influenced us in 1976, there was no historic Gainesville. And Mary and uh, a fellow named Ben Picard and another named Blair Reeves, I'll tell you more about Blair Reeves, and another named uh, Sam Proctor, and uh, another Roy Hunt, who was a university law professor. They happened to all be patients of mine. And uh, when they would come in, we would talk about historic preservation in old houses and so forth. And Roy Hunt, joke, jokingly, uh, after one visit said, you know what, Dr. B, I would like to come over here one time and talk about me and not talk about preservation. <laughs> we were laughing about it. <laughs> Sam Proctor was a wonderful man and a wonderful patient, and so was Blair Reeves. Blair started the, the historic preservation program in the 70s, and he had students going around doing major drawings of, of the houses of, all, of about 20 of the different notable ones. And they originally, they created a committee. Mary was on it, a bunch of other people. I don't remember all the names. And they went around and, and researched these houses and wrote them all up and applied for the National Register of Historic Preservation. About, I don't know, 14 or 15. The Bailey House was one. The Hodges uh, House was one. There were, there, were, there were a bunch of them. And then later, Roy Hunt drew up basically the historic district for the Northeast area. That was been in probably 1970s, 80s, somewhere along in there. And uh, the, the Northeast area was now taking off. Uh, Blair was starting the busy historic preservation movement, was helping identify houses and doing measured drawings uh, of them. Uh, and he, uh, with his students, and, and, and he, he recommended that they, they go ahead and nominate, I don't know, 14, 15 houses and buildings uh, to the National Register, the Post Office Building, the Thomas Center, uh, the Bailey House, there the are whole, the whole bunch of them. So, uh, he, he, and then I guess it's probably, I'm trying to think of the exact date, late 70s, early 80s, he said, well, we, we, we need to really do a district. That had never been done in Gainesville before. Now, uh, the Northeast area was, was taken off and people were buying and restoring these houses pretty, pretty effectively and pretty frequently. But the Thomas Center had closed down. Actually, it was still open. We used to go there for Sunday dinners when we, were, we lived at the, the, the Tiger House at 224 Northeast 10th Avenue. And uh, it closed in the 1970s. And then, actually, Santa Fe Community College started there for a few years and then moved out to their campus. And then the property came up for sale by these guys that were going to tear it down and build a high-rise there, large piece of property. And a fellow named Sam Gowan, who, who had bought a house in the Northeast and was, had worked on it and restored it, he got, he was, he was with, uh, I think, I don't know what he was, he was with history department, I think. But Sam got, got this company called Erla, E-R-L-A, I don't know what that stands for, to come in and do a con, and they raised $10,000 amongst the citizenry of the Northeast to pay them to do a study of the Thomas Center. And they did this study and said, the property alone is worth what they're asking for. The building is sound, can be restored. What ought to be done is the city take it over and make it into a cultural center and city offices. 
And the city took the bait and did that. And now it's now the Thomas Center and Gardens, as you know. And Sam and several others, including my wife, were very instrumental in that. Blair Reeves, in the meantime, had started the Nantucket uh, Preservation Group. We actually went up there a couple of different years and talked to them about hands-on preservation. Uh, Mary did, mostly, uh, how, to, how to actually do it and the sweat and tears that goes into it. And, uh, but Blair was the, 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 the organizer and leader of that that got it going. Roy Hunt was the law professor that, that wrote up the historic uh, nominated the districts. And Earl said you should have four districts, the Northeast first, then the Southeast second, then the Pleasant Street or Northwest black area, old area, and then university related, which would be the, uh, the uh, Southwest area. Uh, and that actually happened. They only completed the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, university related area only 10 years ago, probably. And it was quite controversial because the university people were trying to buy all the houses and tear them down and build high rises. And they did a lot of them, but a lot of them are still there. They did save a lot of them. So it's a district also. So then other communities, uh, Micanope and Melrose and all these started doing historic districts. There was a lady named Murray Laurie. You may want to talk to Murray. Murray lives here. She's on, she's in, she's, she lives in one of the apartments and it's called Cypress. She's still great. Uh, she's they have a little history group that she leads. Murray was the, the uh, for 20 years with the uh, PhD ma uh, master's program, and she reviewed all of the master's and PhD programs for, for, and corrected, the, uh, corrected all the spelling and all of the, all the editors. She edited it for years and is a great writer in her own right. She has done many books, and one on the Matheson, one on Museums of Florida, one on... Uh, a whole, a whole, a whole series of them, and she's here, and 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 she also does national register historic nominations, which means you have to go to the courthouse and review all this property records and so forth, and writes all this stuff up and talks to people, and she is the best, and she's done the historic districts, did the four of those, she did the the, the historic district on campus, the, those buildings and so forth that I gave you that brochure. And, uh, and, 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 and she's helped us immensely on, on numerous projects. And she just finished a book on the history of the College of Medicine that I was involved in, being in the first class. And she actually did the, the writing of it. She had to study all the oral histories that Sam had done and others on university presidents, I mean, uh, deans and department heads and professors. Most all of them, but the early ones had been interviewed. So she... So uh, what happened on that story is not preservation, but it's history. It's when I was a fellow in cardiology, the dean, the first dean of the College of Medicine, Dr. George Harrell, was getting ready to leave and start another medical school in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And he'd been here 10 years. And he and I were very close friends because I was in the first class. And the first class were sort of like their faculty, early faculty adopted children. They wanted, they wanted very much to be successful. And so we got to know them extremely well. There were no upper class members. There were only 40 of us. And I got to know Dr. Harrell well because I was president of the, of the freshman class and met with him all the time. And so in 1968, I went to, went to my mentor, a fellow named Jape Taylor, who was head of a cardiology department and my mentor. And, 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 and my fellowship in cardiology and said, Jay, somebody needs to write down all this history. Dr. Harold's leaving, the provost, provost Russell Poor, who's been a wonderful man, is retired and moved back to Knoxville. And the architect for all this stuff, Jefferson Hamilton, is on his deathbed, I know for a fact. A lot of the other players are getting old and retired and gone and so forth. He said, well, why don't you take a couple of months off and do it? And I said, okay. So I went down and talked to Dr. Harold and said, very important. Now, at the time, unfortunately, they weren't doing oral histories. And he said, I've got four file boxes here that I didn't know what to do with. They should go in an archives and I'll loan them to you and you can go through them and you, you know, get whatever information you want. It's an open book. And I called Dr. Poor 
And he said, oh, this is so important. I'm glad you're doing it. I'll just come down next weekend, spend the weekend. You can talk to him as long as you want. And then I'd go interview Jefferson Hamilton at home and, and other people involved and so forth. And along about that time, Apparently early, Sam Proctor did an oral history on me. It's in the archives. If you, <laughs> I said some. I didn't know it was going to be made public. I said some things in there that I probably <laughs> wouldn't have said. But anyway, he was able to get. Sam had the knack when he did interviews. He could get anything out of you. He just had. And when you read all of those oral histories, like with Dr. Harold, he, 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 he held. He held nothing back. As as the put the pro the good things and the bad things and the problems there were and why he was leaving and all that. But anyway, uh, I wrote all this up and was very proud of it. And, and Jape redlined it and corrected a lot of my English. And my wife, who was an English teacher, corrected it. And I wrote it all up. And uh, then it was 50, 60 pages long. And... Jape, Jape helped a lot with it and, and reviewed it. And I said, well, let's make you second author. No way. Use your papers, your work. You can put me on there at the end of it, thanking me if you want, but nothing. I will not go on that. So where should we send it? Well, it was too long to go to the Florida Medical Association Journal. They just said sh short ones. Jape had been to Yale. He was a Yaley. From, he was born in Mississippi. We went to Harvard and Yale and Whatever, and he was the most brilliant bedside diagnostician I've ever known. Anyway, he said, well, let's send it to my place, the Yale Journal of History, Biology, and Medicine. It's the best in the world, but they're very snooty. They probably won't publish it. So I sent it off, 60 pages, just that thick, you know. <laughs> Didn't hear a thing for a couple of months. Usually you hear within a week or two about yes, no, or whatever. And every day I'd come in to work and Jeff would say, have you heard anything yet? And I said, no. I said, well, it's probably coming back. They probably didn't accept it. But about two days later, I walked in and the phone was ringing and the secretary says, there's a call for you from Yale. I said, really? So I went over and answered it. And he introduced him. I am the editor of the Yale Journal of History of Medicine. I said, yes, sir. What can I, how can I help you? And he said, well, I have the most peculiar manuscript we have ever received. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, this isn't history. Your first class was graduated in 1960, right? I said, yes. He said, well, it's only 1968. So it's too early to be history. And he said, I have on my editorial board eight people. I usually send it out to four. But this one, I sent it out to all eight. And four said, publish it. And four said, it's too early. Don't publish it. And they said, you break the tie vote. And he said, I thought I would call you and ask you why you think we should publish it. And I didn't th think about it or flick an eye. I said, sir, it's very simple. He said, what do you mean simple? I said, 50 years will go by in the blink of an eye. And he said, you're right, we'll publish it. So that came out in 1968, the, 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 the early history of the medical school. And I did it at the 50th reunion. I was a keynote speaker and talked about it and distributed it. And I'll give you a copy if you want a copy. Of it. That, that would be great. And before you go on, that really sparks an idea in me. What we're trying to do, you're talking about eight years later from the start of the college, how, how, how can something be historic in history in eight years? And that's something that we're starting to research is Gainesville's more modern, recent past, you know, everything that was being built oh, well, after like, your well, Victorian house. Like I say, it may not be, it may be early history now, but it won't be, it won't be long. 50 years goes by, I'll tell you this, don't you agree? I was, I was, how, how old was I when I, when I did, I was 30, I was 30, 30 so. I'm 86 now, soon to be 87. And I'm telling you, 50 years went by in the blink of an eye. Well, that gets you through that that story, and it was it was very well received. And it's it's all the early history that nobody had ever written down. Every year we get a new dean. I'd wangle myself to get to the office or to a luncheon or a dinner with them, and I'd say, Dean, so and so, you really ought to have a point of somebody a volunteer to be historian, and write all this up. And the first year was a fellow named Chandler Stetson. He said. You're right, and we'll, I'll do it with you. I'll give you the information you write it up. We'll send a little two-page blurb to the Florida Medical Association and update what's going on at the University of College of Medicine. 
And we did that for about three years. And then later he got sick and died, and that died on the vine. Well, since then, I would talk to the dyes, all nice guys working hard, and they say, this is so important. You need to sign somebody and be doing it. And they would all say, you're right, but we've got so many more things we have to do. And none of them would do it. And I went through six, eight deans. Finally, Michael Good, who the, the, he's, he's not the current dean, he's the dean before last. He came on board as dean. He'd worked his way through up anesthesiology. A great guy, great administrator. He looks about 30 years old, but he's actually 60, but he's very distinguished looking, very handsome, and a super nice guy. Well, somebody in the alumni, alumni association, there was a friend of Mary's from the old days, uh, said he's having a dinner at his house next Saturday, and, and I want you to come, and I'm going to sit you by him, and you can do your spiel about the about the history. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so Mary and I went, we sat down, delightful guy, he and his wife, and I went into my spiel. I had it by then. I had it down pat. And I, Dr. Good, there's something that's really bothering me. It's not. It's it's approaching. You know, six and fifty-five years here, and somebody needs to do a history about the College of Medicine. And he says, Mark, you know what? I've been waking up at night thinking about that. I said, You really? And he says, Would you do it? I said, No, no, no. I don't have the talent. I'm I'm too old. But I know the person that will do it if we can get her, Murray Laurie, and she's a friend of mine. So I called Murray, and she was between jobs. She said, I'd love to do it, but I have to be brought up to stuff. So they appointed the committee. I was on the committee and, uh, and others at the med school and some historians and so forth. And they got Murray to the library, gave her an office, a secretary, and all of the previous oral histories, which she arranged chronologically and went through them and you know wrote notes and then did the story with help from others, but she wrote it uh, chronologically each, each, each 10 years. And it's wonderful and it's beautifully illustrated. I'll I show you a copy. It, yeah. You can buy it, you can get it, you can probably get them to give you one if you go contact the College okay. of Medicine, tell them what you're doing. I'll show you a copy. That'd be great. And but uh, anyway, it was published about two years ago mm -hmm. and then he was promoted to provost at the University of Arizona, where he is now. But we became very close friends. And he actually wrote in the, in the forward, he wrote a, a whole page about my, my involvement with it and how it inspired him to do it, sort of dedicated it to me uh, in that. So that's how we got interested in it, in old houses. That's how Mary got interested in it, who was an incredible, talented gal. Mary passed away two and a half months ago. Uh, oh, from Alzheimer's, terrible, terrible. I'm still not over it, but uh, I, I had no idea it would affect me so drastically. Now she was a very devout Christian. She parent, her daddy was a minister in Lutheran Church. Her brother, who lives near here, and come, came over every day. And she's convinced she's going to go be with her mom and dad. Uh, I, I I won't say what my views are, but physicians generally are sort of a little bit skeptical about things because they see such horrible things. But uh, at any rate, she was convinced she would go and she was better off and all of that, but it just totally, it was, it was just horrible because we spent the last three months unsep inseparable and we grew closer and closer and we just melted really. And when she left, it, part of me left with her. So I was, I'm, I'm getting over it finally. And, and so forth. So anyway, that's how we got interested in preservation. So now I'll just answer y'all's y'all's questions. Yes, here we go. She's <laughs> chomping at the bit. I, okay, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Phyllis Sonmas. Uh, I'm I'm curious about your feeling about the modern houses. Have you lived before in a modern house? Yes, uh, this is a modern house. Uh, I don't object to modern houses. Uh, you're talking about the, uh, the houses being built now? I mean, Harry Merritt's taste like? Well, I will say I'm prejudiced against modern architecture. I, I detest it, these square boxes. I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me whatsoever than the Victorian houses that had turrets and things. But, but that's, just, that's, that's just my prejudice. My son is not. Uh, I think it's a phase go, going through, but modern houses like 
and I don't mean to slam Hale Plantation, uh, Hale, uh, Hale's not plantation anymore, but Hale Community. The neighborhood. <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons, but all of the houses are alike. Plus, they're not well made. My friend who does stained glass was going to put a stained glass in the window, and he was leaning against the wall, and his arm went all the way through to the outside. That's how poorly constructed the walls are. Right. I predict that in 30, 40 years, there'll be having to be major restorations or falling down. Okay. Now, that's not to say that all modern houses are not well built, and some of them are, are, are magnificent, but these these um, large, expensive subdivisions, I mean, they only have, what, five or six plans, and they modify it a little bit. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care for that at all. But now, the, the, the wonderful thing about the Northeast Historic District and the Southeast and the Northwest and even the university-related is their houses built from way from 1900 on up to modern times. So there's every kind of house you can imagine in there which makes for very beautiful when you ride around and look at them. And in the Northeast, almost to my surprise, I went last year to the last, they call it something else. They used to call it the uh, Spring Pilgrimage, but they call it something else now. Promenade? Promenade, think, Spring yeah. Promenade. Why they changed it, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was astounded. Virtually all of them have been redone magnificently. A lot of university professors and young business people, and especially single people, especially women, are buying these things and fixing them up wondrously. I mean, I was astounded uh, at some of them, and and and, uh, and they're, they're 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 really magnificent. And and the and, and the the uh, Tiger House, we sold it, and we sold it to, to a law professor that was coming to create. Uh, what was it? Women's law division that they didn't have. Uh, she was from New England. Anyway, her husband was a lawyer and he did aquaculture in foreign countries like Turkey. He set up aquaculture things on on uh, universe on uh, U.S. grants and made a ton of money. And but she only lasted here about two or three years before she got a big promotion to go back to New England. They, stole her back. Uh, family law, it was called. And then it was for sale, and they brought it down, and some guy bought it, I don't even know his name, and made it to a boarding house. And then Keith Olson and his wife, Roberta, bought it and restored it to its magnificent splendor. And there's a big big article about it, the jewel, the crown jewel of the, of the duck pond area. And now, you know who bought it now? I don't, I don't <coughs> Hire a Krishna's. Oh, that's right. Now, the people that live there are like croaked, but the guy, it's actually not, it's, 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 it's a meeting hall, and some people live there, and the guy that is quite well off that runs that organization uh, is restoring it because it's, it, 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 it developed a, a long-term leak under the kitchen, and the whole corner there has having to be rebuilt and repropped up and so forth. They're working on it now. But he's a really nice guy. I've talked to him several times. and He's fixing it up okay. and so forth. So it'll be fine. Uh, there's one important other thing about the Tiger House. In the front yard is a magnolia. It's now this big. It's 25, 30 years old. It is a cutting from Andrew Jackson's Hermitage from two magnolias that he planted. Oh, wow. And, and they cut up, they took a bunch of cuttings and sent them to various towns. And the one that came here, a, a gal named Meg Niederhofer, who was uh, was the city arborist at the time, who was married to uh, uh, Chuck uh, uh, Hutchinson. Uh, but anyway, she, we planted it there, and I put, I put a plaque there when you go by and see that. Now, afterwards, about 10 years later, 10 years ago, a hurricane hit or a bad storm hit and just killed the two original trees, but they planted them from cuttings from the cuttings from to cuttings. go back there. It's an interesting story. <laughs> the legacy goes on. So, <laughs> modern houses, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not against. Uh, uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of people don't use architects now. And they they have catalogs of hundreds of well I like this and you know and they have plans get you plans and everything a lot cheaper but 
The importance of an architect is to help supervise the project, make sure they do it correctly and they don't go askance because, you know, uh, most people when they build a house frequently have not had experience before of how, uh, dealing with the with the contractors and there's some very good contractors here and there's some that aren't so good and it can be a, a very a very good journey or it can be a very painful journey uh, going through that process. So I have a question for you. Um, thinking about you restoring the Tiger House in the 70s and having difficulty getting financing for that, around the same time when what we now call mid-century modern architecture, so um, what was contemporary in the 60s and 70s, that also had a hard time getting financing because the yeah. banks didn't really believe in that um, kind of the new design, the new thing. Really? What was your experience preserving areas in the duck pond. How did you feel about those newer buildings at the time kind of creeping in with like the courthouse, the new courthouse and um, the plaza by Harry Merritt, all of those designs? Well, I, 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 I'm in favor of those. I think there's room for all, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it's been since 1900, over 100 years, mm -hmm. 120 years. Uh, that's been the, that's been the way it is. Mm -hmm. I, I think they should be well, but the courthouse was a disaster. The courthouse was a perfectly good courthouse. It was small, they needed more room. Mm -hmm. This was 1958. When I came here in 1953, I was already interested in history and I was already, and I loved Gainesville right off the bat and its history and they had big oak trees on either side of the street, University Avenue. They had the courthouse, uh, whatever, and and, and, and this, the, the the county commission decided they wanted to build a new courthouse and tear the old one down. Actually, there was a, there was no organized group like Historic Gainesville. They didn't come into existence until 76. This was 58. Several attorneys, though, sued the county to block and said, build around it, don't take it down. They actually did build around it and then took it down. That new courthouse is L-shaped because that's where the old courthouse was. Well, there was a lot of resistance amongst the people, but they had no power, and they actually sued the county, and it went before a judge uh, who said, I'm very sympathetic. I don't think they ought to take it down personally, but the county commission, as your voted representative, they have the right to take down the courthouse. So they took it down. What they should have done is restored it and added on to it in a magnificent sort of way. Mm -hmm. And then they'd have had plenty of room. You know how long the new one lasted before they had to build an annex? 15 years. If they had restored the original and added to it, it would last 25 or 30 years. But so I was against that. The Harry Merritt thing downtown, and I knew him, and he did a lot in Cedar Key. He mm -hmm. owned property over there and did a lot. Unfortunately, the design of it, uh, I don't. it didn't have the proper engineering. And it was very hot. It was a bowl. And when you sat in there, there was no breeze. They had to put, even if they put big fans, it didn't help. And it was hotter and blazes. If it was 90 outside, it was 104 in there. So they had to redo the whole thing. So it was, right. it, it was roundly denounced by some. I don't, I, I don't think the design of it was bad. I think they just didn't take into account how to deal with the, with the temperatures, so forth. So, uh, the house that he lived in is over on Northeast uh, 16th. Now somebody's painting it now and working on it. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so near Northeast 16th, I mean, uh, excuse me, yeah, nor Northwest 16th and S Northwest 6th Avenue. Right near that big old gray house. Unfortunately, whoever's a store it has no taste. <laughs> And it's hard, it's bad. Well, we um, I'm part of my research. Both of our research includes Harry Merritt, and you're speaking about Murray Laurie. She helped write the National Register nomination for Harry's Wild Cassisi House in Coakley, Coakley Hills. Yes. Do you have any stories about Harry or any experiences with him that you'd like to share? No, <laughs> I, I, I don't. I understand he was a character, and I understand he was. He did a lot of work for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And he did some good things, I think, but I don't know anything Nothing specifically. Too. If Sam were alive, he would know. <laughs> Sam knew everything. And he uh, 
he he would know a lot about lot. Roy probably knows Roy. when mm -hmm. you talk to Roy. You're going to talk to Roy, I assume. Talking to everyone we can. <laughs> talk to Roy. Blair's gone. Blair right. died a sudden death 10 years ago. He did. They went out. Blair loved we used to, his wife, Mary Nell. Did you know her? I did. She just passed away. Mary Nell did? A few months ago. Get out. I didn't know. She was up in Tallahassee. I know. I know. She yeah. was here. I right. saw her every right. month. Mm -hmm. I took, she loved to go out to Northwest Seafood. She was 93, 4. She was. She's a legend. Blair used <laughs> to have these dinners for the architect uh, students and friends. And Mary and I would always get married. Roy would be there. And Sam would be there. And Mary Nell was a gourmet cook. <laughs> Especially desserts were just mm -hmm. out of the <laughs> world. And we would we'd go at least twice a year. And then we'd take them out. And, 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 uh, Blair loved chicken marsala. That was his favorite thing. But anyway, they went out. I wasn't with them. I don't, I don't think Roy Hunt and some other friends. And I don't, some restaurant, he got up to go to the bathroom, didn't come out. And they went back and he was collapsed on the floor, dead. He fell dead. Oh, wow. Probably had a massive heart attack or stroke, they Damn. think. But they miss him. Uh, uh, Roy, uh, I mean, uh, Sam developed something called pulmonary fibrosis, which is a lung disease. And he eventually ended up on, at home on oxygen. And, but he knew everything about all the stories about the university. And he was a real character. He, uh, he had several offices on campus. <laughs> said he needed them all. And, and he's the only <laughs> professor that's ever had it had multiple offices, I think four or five. <laughs> they used, somebody was interim president. I don't remember his name. But he used to tease him about it. Now, do you know the story about the university uh, saving the university building? Do you know that story a little? Oh. I've heard a little from your um, from a video that you did with Dr. Ortiz, but I'd love to hear because I'm interested. You helped start the preservation on campus with the collegiate Gothic architecture, and but now I. I I feel like a lot of it has dwindled. We kind of stopped with the hub, the UF Bookstore building, and and what's to come of everything afterwards. All right, well, the story on that is, uh, this would have been in 1990s. Roy called me. Now, they were, they were patient, as I say, patient of mine. And they'd also, we started working on a, a local museum, the Matheson Museum, in 1990, and opened in 93. And they were on the board. They were the main ones. And a fellow named Ben Picard, English professor, and Sarah Matheson, and a lady named Helen Ellerby, and, uh, and, and five or six other people. In fact, they were on the board for seven years. And I was the president the first few years. And I wouldn't let them leave. I'd say, you got to stay another year longer we get things going. And we bought the, the American Legion building. And then we got a, Roy was on the Committee of Historic Preservation in Tallahassee. And we got the biggest grant they ever gave for 325000 to restore the American Legion building. And uh, through his efforts, he called in his chips from his colleagues, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Sam uh, had gotten to the point that he was literally homebound and had, was on oxygen. But he was still totally alert and vocal. And, and uh, uh, Bernie Machin was president of the university. I, I'd met him, but I didn't know him. And my, my nephew, Josh Bell, who was active with the Methodist Youth Church and actually a minister, of Methodist minister today, he went to the, to, directly to the president and asked the secretary if she would help fund some money to do a, a golf tournament for the, for the student Methodist church people. And she was so impressed by Josh, and he didn't get the money, but said, we don't do that. <laughs> she says, would you like to do an internship here? And he said, yes. And so he was one of his interns at Gophers. And so he would come to our house to eat on Friday, and he'd say, Bernie this and Bernie that. And I said, Josh, don't you call him Dr. Machin? And he says, oh, he won't let us. He wants us to be called Bernie. And I said, well, I want you to do me a favor. Sam Proctor, and he knew who Sam Proctor was, is, is homebound, and he's probably not long for this world. And I want to take Bernie over there for lunch one day. Bess will finish. Fix. Bess was another great cook. And so he said, well, I'll, I'll ask him tomorrow. And he called me and said, he said, yes, Friday, pick him up at 12 o'clock, and we'll go over 
have lunch, and I call call uh, Sam and and called her, and she said, "Oh yes, I'll." And she fixed these. She made a gourmet chicken salad and and key lime pie and stuff. Anyway, we so we go over there, and Bernie and Machin had never met Sam or vice versa. And so, man, they just hit it off. And they say everything he talk about Sam knew t stories uh, galore. And, you know, I'm sitting there listening. I don't know why I didn't record it. But anyway, uh, I didn't. And uh, it got to be about 1 o'clock, and, and he's supposed to come back. He's got appointments starting at 1 o'clock. And I said, do you, you think we ought to go? He said, no, nah, nah, don't worry about it. So pretty soon, one thirty comes along, and they're still talking, just telling these stories back and forth, having the best time. And so uh, they start calling him, you know, on, on the cell phone. From the, said, you've got people waiting. He said, tell them to wait or reschedule them. <laughs> this went on till 3 o'clock. Wow. Can you believe it? <laughs> That's great. And I took him back. He said, That's the most wonderful experience I've ever had. <laughs> well, Sam died a few months later, see. And it's too bad that wasn't. And one other story, and then I'll shut up, <laughs> is when, when uh, Marshall Kreiser was president. It's actually two stories, but uh, he was president, and Roy Hunt calls me. This is in the 90s. said, Mark, I need your help. And he says, the University Senate has appointed Blair Reeves and myself and Sam Proctor and one other guy, and I don't remember his name on faculty, to look into the historic buildings on campus because they have a new uh, director of uh, improvements, or whatever it's called his name is, and he's actually from the University of Virginia, named Gary Kopke, whose whose job is to is improve classroom number of classrooms on campus. And planner, he's university planner. So he said they have appointed this committee, but we want you to be on the committee. We have the authority to place a non-academic guy on there. We need someone who can say things that we can't probably say. <laughs> And I said, in other words, you want me to be the bastard son on your committee, your illegitimate son. And he, he laughed, and so I said, yeah, I'm glad to do it. <laughs> so anyway, we wangled. First, we went to see Robert Marston, and he was retiring. And we presented this plea, you know, they really ought not to tear down that we've heard they're talking about tearing down some of the historic buildings. And he says, well, he had a thick southern accent. We called him Bobby, Bobby Barbecue Marston. <laughs> Bobby Q. Marston was his name. <laughs> She says, I really don't have the authority. That's in the university senate, and I'm retiring. I can't help you. So he said, well, that didn't work. So when when, Mar when, when Marshall Kreiser, we took us several months to get in because they had all the scandals going with the football coach and all. And he was just busy. We finally got an appointment for, for the three of us and myself to go down there. And I got picked, took the old postcards and made pictures of all the university buildings on campus and two large frame things that I took in and gave to him. He was delighted. And he was, I'd never met him. I knew his wife because we were on a history committee together. Wonderful lady. And, but didn't know him. And he just sat there sort of like this, very taciturn, didn't, didn't ask a lot of questions. What can I do? How can I help you fellas, he says. And so, you know, Sam gives his passionate plea, Roy gives his passionate plea, Blair gives his passionate plea. And I said, you know, it's ridiculous. We should save the buildings, build around them, whatever, whatever. And we had about, we were there about 45 minutes. And so he's, he said, uh, uh, his assistant, I don't remember his name, but he said, whatever, Ed, are those buildings really due to be demolished? The Floyd Hall and the uh, Flint Hall and Language Hall. He said, well, I don't know, sir. He says, go call that Gary Kopke guy. Well, I had gone out the week before to see Gary Kopke. And I asked him, I said, show me what your plans are. He had a big map. My job is to include classrooms. Floyd Hall has to go. We'll build a bunch bigger building. So, and Flint Hall and so forth. He says, they're due to be demolished next spring. And I said, well, okay. And so he said, he, it, he came back and he said, yes, sir, they are. He said, you go call that guy. Tell him I said to take them off right now, all of them. And he turned to us and said, I can raise the money right now to restore Floyd Hall and build around it. 
I'll call Ben Hill Griffin. He, he went there. He was a student at Floyd Hall in agriculture. So he calls that afternoon at, after work at six o'clock and Ben Hill says, says, Ben Hill, we need to restore Floyd Hall. He says, yeah, I love that place. I went to school there. I went two years there. And he said, well, let's talk about tearing it down. He says, Marshall, you tell those people if they tear down Floyd Hall, I'll take all my money out of the University of Florida and go to Georgia. Wow. He says, how much do you need? He says, I need $5 million. He said, you got it. <laughs> One phone call. So anyway, another couple called the Keens came along mm -hmm. with Flint Hall, and they wanted to contribute, and they didn't know quite what, a million dollars. And they showed them Flint Hall. This was five years later, four years later. And they... Uh, said, well, we'd like to commit one million. And he said, well, we really need four million. Said, four million? <laughs> and his wife said, well, honey, we got the money. Let's just go ahead and do the four million. So that's the way that got restored. And somebody else did language off. Then they decided to do a historic campus. Murray Curry enters the picture mm -hmm. and does the history on all of them. And then they put up these big, beautiful brass plaques out in front of each one of them that tells the history. And now it's I don't know how many other historic campuses there are. Maybe Harvard or some. I don't know. I've never seen a sign, but the University of Florida has a historic campus, and and that's and, and that's how that happened. Those that committee saved those buildings. No question about it. It's amazing how you yeah, it's amazing. intervene in, in something that's so. Uh, the the you know. other thing that happened, uh, and with Mary and I is, after this happened, I saw it ran into his wife. Maryland or something. Anyway, I said, you know what? We need to have a dinner at the Piger House for the former presidents. There's about six or seven of them, an interim president. And they've never all gotten together as far as I know. She said, I don't think so. She said, I tell you what, let's pick a date. We'll we'll cater the whole thing. You just have the place. Well, it was magnificently restored by then. And and, and Mary had it all decorated. It was, I mean, it was beautiful. Just see, 14 people, and there were 14 of us. I asked Blair to come, and I asked Roy to come, and I, we were there, and, and Sam, unfortunately, was out of town, or he would have recorded it, and I didn't record it. <laughs> well, they got there, and the first thing that happened was, uh, was uh, what was the name? He was a Presbyterian. Uh, he was before before Bernie Mach and Wayne Wrights. Shay Wayne writes. Mm -hmm. He was a devout Presbyterian and a part-time preacher. He's gone to I think seminary at one time. But anyway, and he was a decent president uh, and so forth. But he was a teetotaler. Well, he got there, and I had some cokes and Seven Up, and and I'd made something called President Madison's whiskey sour recipe. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't. <laughs> well, Robert Cage, who invented Gatorade made this stuff called President Madison's Whiskey Sour Recipe, and it's made by taking 50% whiskey and 50% lemon juice with the peels and soaking them overnight, and then the next day take out the peels, no sugar, and mix them, freeze them with ice in a blender, mm -hmm. and you cannot taste the liquor. <laughs> and one of them makes you feel good, two of them gives you a buzz, and three of them will put you down. You have to be very careful because it's pure 50%. Whiskey. Well, well, we go through, and I'm making offering everybody whiskey sour recipes and explaining it. And J. Wayne Wright's wife couldn't come. She said she was under the weather and didn't come. And he said, "I'll have one of those." <laughs> so I fixed him. And a while later, he said, "Could I have another?" I said, "No." <laughs> Put you down. You're not used to it. Anyway, they had the meal. It was magnificent. You know, beef, whatever, tenderloin, whatever. And so on and so forth. And I figured, well, we'll have a nice dinner and everybody's very polite and chatty. And, you know, it started at 7 and by 8, 8.30, everybody would be going home because we work the next day. This was on a Wednesday night. And so Marshall Kreiser, he says, well, stood up and said, you know, we've never gotten together. He said, I thought it would be fun if each of you would tell why you came, what you think you did, what you wanted to accomplish and what you didn't didn't get accomplished, because none of those people had interfered with when Newans came. They didn't try to influence them in any way. None of them, and they went right around the room. It was fascinating to hear them. Wow. 
Well, eight comes, eight thirty, nine, nine thirty, ten o'clock, and they're still in there yapping, you know. Mary and I are looking at each other. I had to work the next day. They finally left around ten or ten thirty, and they had the best time. And I didn't record that. And Sam wasn't there, unfortunately. He was sick. He wasn't there. And I always said you need to have another one, but they never had another one. But uh, that was uh, another thing set up. So, other questions any of you have? Good. I think for me, my 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 last question at least is um, with how instrumental you were on campus saving those buildings up till today. We've had recently Norman Hall has been restore, restored um, and updated, and so has Newell Hall has been that. restored and updated. But what are your thoughts on, for instance, the police building, the radio, um, the radio station building being demolished? Well, every time an organization has a house that they want to tear down, or, or private owners, they always say three things. It's fascinating. It's 100 percent. Oh, it's got roaches in it, and it's got termites all on the foundation, and it's rat infested, and it's in terrible shape. It's about to fall down. They said that with the Hodges house. That's where they want to tear those buildings and build a brick recreation hall. And you go look at them and they're sure they've got roaches. They've been neglected. And yes, they need some repairs, but they're solid. They're, they're made with hard pine. The beams in those things are this big that never rots. You can't even drive a nail in them. They're so hard. It's called heart pine, these big pines. And they would use only the heart to make the beams in the turn of the century until they were all cut out. So my view on all of these, since they are historic, even that building, is to build around it. And if you build around it and you want to get benefits, if you do it privately, if you build around, you, you can't change the old house, but you can add on to it and build a, a hallway or something and attach to it and build around it mm -hmm. and get, get, get tax benefits. if if it's a private enterprise, a private building. And so you can build around these buildings and accomplish the same thing and still maintain the ambience of the way it was originally. And the University of Florida has done a magnificent job, mainly because of Roy, Blair, Sam, and also uh, Marshall Kreiser. Absolutely. And Marshall had gone, it was a student there, and he just... He said, "Why well, we don't tear down anywhere. And so did so did Ben Hill Griffin, who's dead now, say the same thing. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? And, it, and it, to me, it's such an obvious answer to these things. Uh, but some people, here, here's the deal. Some people think when they own a building, they can do anything they want with that building. They own it. Some people think when they have a pet, they can do anything they want with that pet and maltreated, mm -hmm. that they own it. Some people thought for many, many, many years that they owned people as property, as you know, in that story. My view about houses is you don't own them to do anything you want. You have a ownership to, to administer to them and take care of them like they were a family member and to nourish them and to, to bring them back if they need to be brought back. And, uh, and that is your duty, not to just really nearly do anything you want, paint them purple, totally alter them around or tear them down uh, or whatever. So you, you, your, your ownership is really a, is, 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 you're only here for a finite number of years, a very small number of years, really, 50, 60 years, 70 years you own a place or whatever it is. And then it's in somebody else's hands. So you're, you're, to my view, duty bound to take and minister and take and nourish it and take care of it and restore it properly. And you've got these wonderful guidelines that are not onerous at all. All they basically say, the historic preservation guidelines, is you need to restore it to its former glory and not make any big changes in the front and all this that, but you can do anything you want inside. They don't. They don't, they're not horrible about color. You've got a large palette to pick from, so forth. The final story on Mary is she, when she restored an old house, she would go to PPG Paint, and she would you could buy quarts of paint, 
and she would say, uh, like, she, like she wanted to do one of the yellow or yellows, she would she would paint several different mixed colors mm -hmm. and look at it in the morning, noon, and night. When she did the Hodges house that we moved, she wanted to paint it a blue. And she put, every day she'd go get four or five quarts, just kept going on, on, driving me crazy. At night I'd come home, did you pick the paint color yet? No, not yet. And after 25 quarts, one day she came and said, we got it. And it was a gray blue, beautiful gray blue. It's called Mary Bear Blue. I still get calls once a year or so. Can I get Mary Bear Blue? Uh, it, was, it was a beautiful color, but that, she was noted for that uh, color. So any other any other final questions? But my, 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 my views on historic preservation, and it, you know, it amazes me. I have people maybe once a year or every two years, somebody from the Gainesville Sun will call me and say, um, could we talk to you? We're going to do an article, and we want to know, do you think historic preservation is a good thing? And I say, my God, lady, or man, or whoever, have you researched it at all? Well, I'm going to write this article about it. And I said, well, have you gone to the Matheson and looked at their files under historic preservation? The importance and why it's good and why it's right has long since been determined many years ago, and that all that stuff is down there explaining why it's important. You know, it's not, it's not, a, it not, is it an, an important issue? Is it a good thing or not? That's been decided long ago, except for you yo-hos that don't do any <laughs> research on it. And then they write this inane article about, is it really a good thing or should we just modernize it? It just makes me sick. Right. It's, so I have to write a letter. It's a cycle. <laughs> but it is a cycle. Yeah. But by and large, uh, you know, the, the number one, the cost of doing historic preservation is not as much as your construction. That's number one. Number two, once they're done, then people are very proud of them, you know. And, 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 and people who, a lot of people rented in our Victoria apartments that have been bought their house to restore it. And it's, it becomes part of the family. They fall in love with the project and the house. And they say, it's part of us now. It's an amazing thing to see that happen. Now, not everybody does that, but I bet, I bet the 50 or 100 people that lived in our apartments and wanted to go get a house or a store somewhere. They, <laughs> they, we'd the run into them on the street. They even if they yeah. go out of town, they, they want an old house. And they say, you just fall in love with the house, you know, and it becomes part of the family, sort of. So that's my view on it. And that was Mary's view, very, very much so. Well, I certainly appreciate your contributions and Mary's and Blair's and Roy's and Sam's and everyone's. And I feel like the torch has been passed for us to preserve not only what you guys looked at, but also everything that was built in your lifetime as well. We're looking at, you know, like the Dickinson Hall, the old Florida Museum by William Morgan. We're starting to look at these new decades of buildings as well. So, yeah, that's a fascinating place. Yeah. I, I like, I don't, I see nothing wrong with that. I'd be sick if they... It's only the unique. It's only one like it, probably in the country. Absolutely. But they put dirt off. <laughs> Who designed that? I don't know. But I thought it was a stroke of genius. <laughs> and, uh, but they don't all have to be the same. They don't have to all be, you know, Victorian colonial revival. They don't. It can be all sorts of all sorts of interesting things. And I love cracker houses. I, my people were dirt farmers, except for my dad. He's the first one who went to college, and he, with my my grandparents, had on both sides had these old wooden, unpainted cracker houses all the way down the front, no AC, mm -hmm. early on, no electricity, no lights, no running water, had a pump there, they could pump water in the kitchen. And uh, those are fascinating and so forth. But uh, I, I, I like the variety. And I thank you all for being involved and in, 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 in passing on the wand. Mm -hmm. But, uh, the, the, the three major, well, there were really four major players, and Roy was one in law, and Blair in preservation, and Sam in history, and a fellow named Ben Picard that you never met. Ben was an English professor, and he was a great writer, and he wrote all sorts of books about local history, and he wrote that little that one a little there. That's Ben Picard. Ben would. <laughs> he was on the he was on the Matheson board too, and he's a real character. He hiked the he hiked the Appalachian Trail a couple of times. 
but he and so he was a great hiker. But he would he would we would talk at the mountain. We need a book like this little book there on the on the buildings. He say, okay, let's appoint a committee, and he'd get us all together, five or six of us. This is what we do, and this is what we're going to do, and you do this, and you do that. And two weeks later, he'd have the manuscript. He was a one man, <laughs> and it would be very delightful. And that's very, fairly thorough and good there. I mean, there's a lot of information in it. And a lot of it comes from those initial interviews that about 15 or 20 people that lived in the Northeast and Southeast went around and did nominations for the National Register that are now part of the National uh, Part of the, uh, of the of the the different four districts. four mm -hmm. districts, so it's fascinating. I got involved with the museum when I went into practice because number one, I loved history. My parents loved history. We used to ride around. I, I also maintain that there are people who have collector brains. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but. It's neurologically not been described. There are people who have uh, musical brains. My second son, Will, is, was a musical prodigy and is in Nashville and was always, he, he could pick up, when he was a little boy, he could pick up and play tunes. He was un incredible. And he writes and he sings and just so forth in Nashville. It's a major player. And he has a musical brain. He thinks differently than I do about it. I don't. But I had a collector's brain. Starting when I was a little bitty boy uh, at eight or nine, I started collecting these little match safes, you know, that have tear them out. Mm -hmm. Well, after World War II, 75 percent of men smoked because they gave free cigarettes during the war and they didn't know it was a risk for cancer. And women started smoking and everybody started doing these ads on the front of these little match safes. And towns did not have garbage cans on their streets back then. And when people would finish with them, they'd just throw them on the street. Well, I'd go around and collect them. And when we go to Pensacola or some other town, I, they'd let, let me go, and I'd go up and down the streets for an hour. And I collected thousands. And my mother, f for some unknown reason, let me put them up in the living room, a nail here and a nail there, and I'd put them across the string, <laughs> and I filled up the living room in about two or three years. And she finally said, son, you know, we need to get, we need to, we need to pack these up. People think we're a little bit nuts over here. And so then I also got interested in jugs. And I saw one in the home ec room and the teacher was very nice and I just thought it was beautiful. I'll show it to you. And it, uh, I, I came on and I said, I want to collect demijohns, whiskey jugs. And dad said, well, I know I'm up bird hunting days. I know where there's abandoned stills. There may be some around. And we would go on Sunday afternoons to these old cracker houses out in the country that had been abandoned. I'd crawl around underneath and look around the yard and the barns, whatever. And I'd find, I wouldn't find one very often, but I'd find one here and find one there. And I was fascinated by these old moonshine jugs. And then I aggressively started collecting them later and had ones from Jacksonville and ones from Ocala. There were none from Gainesville, unfortunately. But I had a very extensive collection that was in my office in all the rooms on shelves uh, with that. Uh, but uh, so I collected jugs. So when I, I started practice, I thought, well, I need something to, to relax me at night. So I'm going to collect postcards. So I collected first Gainesville cards, then other counties, and then Florida cards. And in Gainesville, we have 1,600 and have virtually 98% of the postcards that exist. It's an amazing accomplishment at the museum mm -hmm. because I aggressively went after it, still do. Every week, I go through on eBay all Gainesville, U of F, all of the towns in the county, and I, I may find one, or I may find none, or I may find three or four that I don't have, and I, I bid on them, and I know how to get, them. I know how, to, how, to, how it works. I can, <laughs> I can, I get most of them. Uh, so I still collect those, actually. Did you have a, a Gainesville photo archive as well? It's at the Matheson. Yes, Yours? yes, there is. Mm -hmm. There's also a book, and I, I just gave the last one away. I would give you a copy, Penny, for your thoughts with the best postcards. Uh, it's at the Matheson. I'm going to get some more and bring home. I just gave the last one last week, actually. To, to Tammy here. She was here. So anyway, 
and I'm still okay. Yeah. I've got an appointment at one to for the doctor, but, I, but we're all right. Okay, so anyway, you. I got interested in postcards, and then I thought, well, I'll do old early heart Florida history books. And there was a place in Chulioto, Florida called Mickler's, and they had a three-story, huge Victorian house full of old history books of all kinds. And they also got from when when the uh, uh, presses went out of they they they, they went and they 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 took the rest of the books they gave them to them so they had all these wonderful books and I had a list and I was collecting old Florida history books and I got a bunch of them from them and other places I advertised and the same with postcards and that made the nucleus of the Matheson Museum still there. A penny for your thoughts is the best of the best postcards. And actually, Murray Laurie helped me write it, and she's a co-author on it because she had a lot of uh, good editions. I said, well, you need to come on <laughs> as my co-author. So penny for your thoughts is beautiful, it's wonderful, and uh, and so forth. And, and then I'll, and I'll have to get change clothes to get ready to go to the doctor, but I want to show you the book on the College of Medicine. Thank if you. I can get up. Uh, here you go. Okay. I've had back and hip surgery is the problem. Okay. I'm a little bit unsteady. All right, I got Good. it. I'm okay. You need help getting to the next spot? No, no, no. All right. Good. <laughs> Once I stand up and get going, I'm all right. I wanted to show you this book. If you call the alumni people and tell them what you're doing, they may give you a copy. I've got some pictures marked. I made copies of, but that's ah, that. And okay. I wanted to show you the jug. <laughs> this was my first jug. That would have been 1943. <laughs> okay. We call those demijohns, or I call them jugs, and they put moonshine in them, <laughs> which which people made in the woods, made whiskey. And this was your first one? Yeah. <laughs> I've, I, had, I had probably 30 or 40, but I've sold all the others. But anyway. Well, Dr. Barrow, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And being able to see, um, we're going to find a copy of this book and see yeah. your first jug is, is right. fantastic. And this, when we had the, the grand opening of the, of the Hodges house, oh. one of our employees his name Kevin Turhorse. He was the gopher. He went. To, he had helped other people, and his mother came up at the beginning of it and said, "She was a nurse at Alachua General, and she said, I 'I'm also a poet.' And she wrote this poem. I'm gonna give that to you. Oh, thank you. The Victorian Queen. It's beautiful. And this, I just found this picture yesterday in the files. That's Mary with her wig on. <laughs> Sam Gowan. And Jane, Jane Myers, she bought a house the same time Mary and I did and restored it, and a lady named Sarah Dryley. It's a real early picture. That's establishing the historic Gainesville meeting. Wow. I need <laughs> to take a proper photo of that. <laughs> and I just came across it yesterday, yeah. as a matter of fact. We're, we're going to snap a photo. That? That's the meeting to establish historic Gainesville wow. in 1976. Wow. Six. And that gave them the power. I mean, at one time they were going they were going to pave over the duck pond and make that a thoroughfare. Right. It's a long another story. I won't get into. It. <laughs> well, I might right. snap a picture of that before we leave. But thank she you can. so much. I think we'll. She's got a picture. You we'll, got a picture? We'll, we'll wrap it. She's got a video recording, but I'll take one really quick. Okay. All right. You can do that. Well, we'll let you get ready for your appointment. And yeah. this has been. So uh, wonderful. anytime you want to come back for long, you know, we can talk more. I wish Mary had been here. I wish so too. Because she was, uh, as no, can, can you imagine 24 houses Amazing. in your career? It's it's, it's just yes. indescribable. Yeah. Such and a big she was great us. at it. I mean, she was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Thank, Thank you so good. much. Thank, Thank you so much. Nice to meet you.